Hi, Dr. Ashton here, and we're still talking about chapter six. Now we're talking about our fourth lecture, which is about binocular cues. So we did ocular motor, we did monocular, now we're talking about binocular. This is when we take those two separate retinal images that we had in monocular cues, those static retinal cues, and those dynamic cues, those monocular cues where it's just in one eye, and we put them together. Um, so this is an information, those, both of those things together. And primarily all this is is binocular disparity and how um, we figure out what information came from what retina. So binocular depth cues are again occur between the two eyes are needed for any of these cues to work, okay? So we've all done this. You put your thumb in something, you close one eye, you close the other eye, you can hide it with one but not the other or your thumb looks like it's moving. Do it right now. Put your thumb in front of the screen, do the two different eyes, your thumb looks like it's moving even though it's standing still. Um, this is because that information we're getting from both eyes um, is needed for most of our cues to work. The next thing we're going to talk about is the stereoscopic depth perception. So the idea that we have both of these eyes um, and they're giving us this really good depth cue. So here's a small video, a short video. The depth perception that your stereoscopic vision provides is one of the most important tools in your visual toolbox. To illustrate just how useful it is, try this simple experiment. Take two coins, preferably of the same size, and pinch one in each hand. Raise your arms at your sides and quickly touch the edges of the two coins together in front of you. Not too hard, right? Now reset your arms and try it again with one eye closed. Without slightly different perspectives from both eyes creating a helpful sense of depth, the task becomes much harder. The way our eyes are positioned and the keen depth perception that comes with them gave humans evolutionary advantages that have helped us survive and thrive. Thank your depth perception the next time you're able to take the money and run. Despite their corny lines, um, it's a good demonstration. So you can get two coins. If you do something wider, it's not going to work as well. Like if I, I tried it with like highlighters that are thicker, um, because they're thicker, they'll still touch each other. So you need something really, really thin, like a coin, um, for this to be able to really work well. And again, this is giving you information um, about depth um, from the, this stereoscopic vision, the idea that both eyes um, are really giving you this vivid image of depth um, because of the differences between them. The differences between what your retin what e ret each retina is seeing is called binocular disparity. Um, and again, this is primarily what this chapter is this uh, lecture is about um, and how your eye really makes sense of this binocular disparity. Um, so there's a launch pad demonstration that I want you to go through. I think it'll do a really good job um, of walking you through the different vocabulary really, um, and also how these different things work. Um, so we have crossed and uncrossed disparity, um, and this is the idea that it gives us information about depth um, based on these things. Okay, so go through a launch pad um, demonstration and it will walk you through um, all of these um, various things. We're really good um, at taking, at noticing these small binocular disparities. So again, if you haven't um, do the, the demonstration, if it means pausing this video and coming back to it, go do it because otherwise the rest of this isn't going to make sense. Um, so most people are remarkably sensitive to these things. Um, some people can um, notice really, really small differences in depth, um, even at five feet away. And again, the stereoscopic vision is really helping us with this. Um, it can help us at distances about 200 meters away. So it really is very important um, for our evolutionary adapt adaptations. Um, and what gives us how the magnitude of how different these things are um, is what gives us information about depth. So here are two images. Um, we see that our fixation point um, in the first image on the left is the red capsule. Um, and what we can see then is because of this difference in cross disparity, um, we have a bigger difference in cross disparity um, for the brown object than we do the green object, which tells us that the brown object is closer to us um, than the green object is compared to our fixation point of the red. I like to remember this as crossed 
disparity um, translates to closer, okay, than the fixation point. So the C in cross and the closer than the fixation point is how I like to remember cross disparity. Um, the image on the right um, is uncrossed disparity. And again, here we have our fixation point. This time it's the brown. Um, we're focusing on the closest one. And the uncrossed disparity um, are the images that are farther, um, the objects that are farther than fixation. Um, and so when we have the larger um, uncrossed disparity, um, that's going to be the furthest object away, where the smaller uncrossed disparity is going to be closer to fixation. But both of these are further away than what we're fixating on. So then really what we have to do is we have this disparity um, in these retinal images, but how does your eye figure, how do you figure out what information is coming from what eye? Um, so this correspondence problem um, refers to the fact that the visual system needs to identify which part of the image matches with which part of the other image from these two separate retinas. So we have these two separate pictures from two separate retinas based on all these monocular cues. How do they put those back together? How do we do this? Um, and this is that correspondence problem or correspondence matching. The visual system needs to match up these pairs um, from image from your left retina and image from your right retina and match these things up. The problem is, is we showed you really easy kinds of binocular disparity things, these different colored capsules. The problem is real scenes are really complex. They have objects of similar colors. We have occlusion. We have things in mo motion. We have different textures. Um, and that makes this correspondence matching a lot more difficult, okay? It's not going to be as simple as it is with really simple objects. So there's two hypotheses um, that your book discusses talking about how our brain does this or how our visual system does this. The first is which um, is that we notice pieces of objects in each retina um, and they take those pieces and put them together and we that's how we match the retina. So if I'm looking at my laptop, I have two images of my laptop on the left retina and one on my right retina. This hypothesis would say, okay, we're going to take part of this laptop picture with this laptop and this, and we're going to put them on top of each other, and that's how we're going to match up. Um, that's how we're going to match up these things. That's how we're going to do corresponding matching. But in this way, the, the visual system is labeling each fi um, feature um, before it does this matching. So object recognition here comes before correspondence mapping. The second hypothesis is that um, we take simple properties that we've already talked about, such as color and edge, um, and these are what's matched up. And once we match those up, then we have object recognition. So here we have that correspondence matching based on those kinds of visual features that we've already talked about in the previous chapters. Um, and that leads, um, that correspondent matching happens based on those properties, and then object recognition happens afterwards. So we'll talk about um, kind of the validity of these two hypotheses in an, an experiment and a series of studies that really helps us answer this. Um, the crucial difference between these, again, is which one, in what order correspondence matching is happening. Is it happening first or is it happening second? Is it happening before object recognition or is it happen happening afterwards? To really understand how they determined which of these hypotheses is right, first we have to talk about um, some of the, the tools that they used. So Wheatstone was the first guy to really try to figure out how these two eye, this information goes together. Um, and he created a stereogram. Um, and you have seen stereograms many a time. Um, you just didn't know that they were stereograms. Um, and most of the time we see these in a stereoscope. If you're doing it in a, in a research study, you would see it in a stereoscope. Um, and they're two separate images that by themselves don't have depth. They're 2D images, but when you put them together, through a stereoscope, it has this impression of depth. Um, and again, this is the brain um, automatically interpreting this um, based on this binocular disparity. So a stereogram um, is, will be something like this, these magic eye um, kinds of things. I can't do these. <laughs> I have never, ever been able to do these. Um, in theory, if I had a stereogram, maybe I could, and I'm sure I could, um, but just kind of the relaxing your eyes and crossing your eyes a little bit to be able to see it, 
not the case. Um, they tell me that this picture is of a scorpion, um, so I hope it's right, um, and I hope it's something appropriate. Um, but if you'd like to pause the video and try and see it, um, you can. Again, these are those kinds of magic eye things that we've seen um, before. And again, this is a stereogram. Another version of a stereogram um, is an anaglyph. An anaglyph is what you think of as a kind of the red and blue 3D image. Okay, um, so they're printed in contrasting colors uh, and they're superimposed so that you can see this. Again, you need those filters. If you look, your textbook came um, with the filters. Um, so they came with some 3D kind of glasses. Um, so you can get those out and I'm going to show you an anaglyph. There's also some really good book, ones in your book that I encourage you to look at too. Um, but I'll pause the video um, and go get your uh, fancy smancy 3D glasses. Okay, so here's an anaglyph. You may have to adjust your screen to make it work, um, but you can see one image and it's 3D. If you adjust the glasses and your screen just right, um, you'll be able to see a 3D image of Las Vegas. Again, when you look at it without the glasses, um, there's two separate images. Again, what's happening here is we're taking the red and the bl blue and we're canceling those things out, um, which is giving us this illusion of depth in this 3D image or this anaglyph. Your book has some really great ones. I encourage you to go look at those. So how we figured out the answer to these two different hypotheses, um, whether correspondence matching happens before or after object recognition, um, was done by this individual, um, Jules, um, and he was a Hungarian researcher who was doing research here in the United States. Um, and he was trying, he did the, the crucial experiment to figure out how it solves this correspondence program um, problem, which one happened first, um, whether it was um, correspondence matching, then object recognition, or object recognition, then correspondence mapping. He did this using a stereogram, which is why I had to tell you what stereograms were first. And he did them with a random dot stereogram. Um, this is again a grid of randomly assigned dots, um, except there's a displacement in part of it, which allows us to um, kind of see um, depth um, perception. Again, this is primarily done with a stereoscope. Um, this one that's in your book, if you relax your eyes, you know, just right and kind of cross them, you can kind of see it. This is the closest I've ever gotten to seeing one of these magic eye things. Um, so, um, so good luck. Hopefully you have better luck than I do. Um, but again, your textbook for figure 627 gives you instructions on how to kind of relax your eyes um, so that you can see this. But this is a random dot stereogram. Um, and what this did was it really provided a strong argument that correspondence matching was happening before object recognition. If you can't see this like I can, um, here's the difference um, between them. So essentially they took um, those different blocks um, and they just shifted it um, to the left in the left eye view versus the right eye view. Um, and this creates um, this again, this illusion of depth. The more modern versions of these um, are going to be um, RDSs as anaglyphs. So you can use your 3D glasses again here um, and you can see two different images. Um, these I can see, yay! <laughs> um, so get those out on the left, you'll see, um, pause in case you don't want a spoiler alert. Um, on the left, you'll see an X, on the right, you'll see a heart. Um, and again, these done as anaglyphs with those color differences, um, again, we can see those. So again, what this experiment told us about these random dots um, stereograms is that correspondence matching is needed to perceive object disparity, I mean, binocular disparity. There isn't an actually an object in any of these RDSs. So in these random dot displays, there's not actually an object there, it's random dots. Um, but the RDS produces this perception of depth. It produces this perception of an object. So this tells us that correspondence matching must precede object recognition. Um, so because we're seeing an object that's actually not there, um, we are able to say that correspondence matching must be happening before we assign a label to it. Um, but how does the brain actually solve this? So we know that correspondence is happening before object recognition, but how is it doing it? We're still not 100% sure, um, but these researchers in 1979 started to kind of give us some answers about this. 
the visual system makes two assumptions about the world um, when matching the features from the left and the right visual scenes, the left and the right retina. The first of which is that each feature in one retinal image will match only one feature in another. So one dot in your RDS only matches one dot in your, in your left RDS only matches one dot in your right RDS. Um, your left RDS is not matching four dots in your right RDS. It's a one to one ratio. The other assumption that we, the visual system is making um, is that visual scenes tend to consist of both smooth and continuous um, surfaces with relatively few abrupt changes in depth. Um, so all that stuff that we know about object recognition, um, your visual system is using that as information about depth. So all our information that we had um, from chapter four in recognizing visual objects, the information about gestalt and edges, detection, and all of those sorts of things, the visual system is using that information um, to say, okay, well, we're not going to have this really abrupt change in depth. Uh, and so it's using that um, as well to match up these two different retinal images. So the neural basis of this stereopsis um, is that we have different binocular cells that are turned into, tuned into different disparities. Um, either the cross disparity, the uncrossed, remember cross means it's closer than the fixation point and uncrossed is further away than the fixation point and zero disparity would be the exact same um, distance as the fixation point. Um, that they're turned in, tuned into these differences. Um, and because of that, and some of these will even be tuned into a specific magnitude of this. Um, and because of this, this will allow the visual system um, to fire differently um, based on these differences in depth, based on these differences in binocular disparity. So the visual system uh, takes these, this binocular information um, and it's done throughout the visual pathways. These are cells are found in both the what and the where how pathways. So it's both in the ventral and the dorsal pathways. Um, and again, they're going to respond. They are going to have receptive fields just like we talked about um, in chapter three. They're going to have receptive fields instead of responding to different edges. Um, they're going to respond to differences um, in terms of um, disparity. An example of this is here. So um, here we'll have um, differences. We're fixating here um, on the green cactus. And as um, kind of we move, um, we'll see differences um, in how the orange cactus um, moves, okay? Um, and so the Im in the images here, we have the red means that the receptive field is stimulated, um, and the blue, and this is on the retina, means that the receptive field is not stimulated. And you can see that as we move and get different Im information about depth and cross versus uncrossed disparity, um, we're going to have we're going to have different information, different kinds of firing. So in the first image, um, we have um, kind of a medium rate firing. Um, in the last image, we have a really high rate firing um, because in that situation, both receptive fields are stimulated. Um, in the first two, only one receptive field is stimulated. Um, and so um, the, the binocular cell doesn't respond. But in that last image, because both receptive fields are stimulated um, in what would be here, cross disparity, um, we're going to have an increase in that binocular cell response. And again, this is how that neural system um, is taking this binocular disparity and using it um, to fire and give us information about depth. So this ends our conversation about binocular cues. Thanks.